Let's do it. Hi everyone, we're actually going to start now. Um, we got everyone on seats, we got all the doorways clear, so everything's great. Um, so we've got Paris from Tasmania, and he's yes. going to be very, very important details. Um, we're going to be talking about unity. Yes, hello. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here. You can look at me now. Uh, <laughs> I have arrived. Uh, this session is Simulation Environments for Machine Learning. My name is Paris. You can tweet at me or whatever you like, or not. I don't mind. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking in the science and data track. That's really cool. Uh, it's good to be speaking on you know, the traditional land of the people from here. I think the Gadigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation, maybe. I'm not 100% sure who they are. But I normally speak in Melbourne and Tasmania, so I have to look up these things when I travel around Australia. Uh, but it's great to be here. Sydney, Sydney seems to have a really nice convention centre now, which is an improvement. <laughs> uh, this is a talk on very visual machine learning uh, with a little bit of Python, tiny bit of Python. So if you're Python people, I'm going to disappoint you greatly for a variety of reasons, least of all because there's not much Python here. Uh, I'm a professional game developer. I do lots of things. I'm an enthusiastic amateur at machine learning. Uh, we're only recently kind of embracing it and doing a lot of machine learning things. Uh, professionally, I'm a game developer. I'm also a very amateur Pythonista. I don't really know how Python works. It kind of confuses and frustrates me all at once. Uh, most of my programming world is Swift and C Sharp. So I like Python. I love using Python. I don't really understand Python. Uh, despite that, I do have a PhD in computer science that I somehow tricked a university into giving me. And I do love my dogs, which you can see here. They're pretty great. Uh, I am from Tasmania. You should visit. It's pretty excellent. Uh, and the requisite bio slides, I write a lot of books. Many of them are related to the topics I'm talking about. And I build a lot of video games. We're best known for this video game, which won a BAFTA, which is pretty cool. So this topic is Python adjacent. Again, I'm going to apologize a couple of times here, because Unity, which is one of the technologies we're talking about here, is not Python at all. It's C sharp. What can you do? Uh, <laughs> I like C Sharp. Uh, it frustrates and confuses me in a completely different way to Python, but it's, you know, it's an interesting language. Uh, we're going to talk about Unity for the simulation building and Python for the machine learning. Okay? So Python adjacent, the Python stuff is, is there, but not front and center. You have to trust me, it's powered by Python. So there's three pieces of this talk. There's Unity, which is a game engine. Has anyone here used Unity? About an eighth of you, maybe? Yeah. Uh, there's a machine learning framework, TensorFlow. Has anyone here used TensorFlow? OK, that's much better. Uh, and there's a thing called Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit. I'm not going to ask if you've used that one, because I'm assuming it's going to be like some fraction of you. Thank you, Miles, over here. Uh, so the game engine Unity is the thing we build a simulation environment in. The TensorFlow is the machine learning bit. And then we glue them together with this Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit. OK, and I'll come back to each of these as we step through. But basically, this talk is a quick introduction to the power of simulation-driven machine learning using a game engine. Okay? This is the game engine. It's called Unity. It's a disturbingly large percentage of the games industry. Uh, not here to debate the relative merits of that. It's kind of horrifying. Uh, it's very good, though. So there's that. And it's free for most reasonable purposes, despite not being open source. Let's not go into that either, though. Um, Unity looks like pretty much every other pro app you've ever seen. It's dark. I don't know why pro apps are dark. Uh, Unity lets you build 3D scenes and simulate them. Okay, it's designed for games, but it's useful for everything from VFX to building you know, simulations of things you want to model. In this case, I've added a cube. That's pretty exciting. Everyone loves cubes. Uh, Unity behaves very much like any other 3D environment where you can add things and move them around. So now I've squashed my cube and made it into a floor. Okay, hopefully everyone's kind of familiar with this. I've added a sphere above it. Now I've renamed the sphere and the flattened cube to floor and ball, respectively, so I can kind of keep track of what they are. That's very exciting. And then if I play the scene, absolutely nothing will happen because there's no in interaction in this environment, but I've created a very nice 3D scene with a floor and a ball. Okay? So this is pretty straight, uh, straightforward stuff. It's a, it's a game engine, right? Everyone's used a game engine once or twice or played with a game engine once or twice. Unity composes things of pieces, so if we add a component to the ball called a rigid body. We can then make the ball fall to the floor because it will be affected by the physics simulation which Unity ships with. Right? So now we have a ball with a rigid body on it, which means please simulate this in a physics engine, which means the ball falls to the floor. That's not very exciting, though. So if we want the ball to bounce, we create a physics material, which is Unity's term for some properties that let you simulate something with the physics engine in a certain way. 
we set the properties of that to be very bouncy. So we basically set the you know, bounce combined to maximum, which means it'll just keep incrementing as it bounces. And then we apply that physics material to the ball by you know, selecting our ball and dragging the, the thing we just created onto it. Very exciting. And then if we run the, run the simulation, it will bounce. I think that's playing, is that playing? No, there we go, now it's playing. So if we play that, now the ball will bounce, which is incredibly exciting. <laughs> okay, that's much more exciting than just looking at the ball sitting there, right? Okay, and that's, you know, that's 10 seconds of work, that's pretty great. Unity is a very powerful way of constructing very, very vibrant simulation scenes that can do all sorts of stuff. We can take this one step further. So not only can we make the ball bounce, but we can add C sharp. C sharp is very exciting. We can create a C sharp script, basically another file within our project here. We'll name it bounce. And I'm sorry, this is C sharp. I don't know, like, do Python people spontaneously combust when they see something? I, I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is C sharp. Uh, I don't know how much people know C sharp, but hopefully this is mostly readable to anyone who's programmed in any modern programming language. Uh, it has a class with the same name as the file, a public Boolean, it's called print debug, which we default to false, and an implementation of a method called on collision enter that if print debug is true, then prints out a thing saying what was collided with. And this on collision enter is called by the physics engine when something hits whatever object this script is attached to. Hopefully that's pretty uh, self-explanatory for everybody. So that's, that's a really simple script. We're gonna create that script, and then we're gonna drag that script onto the floor. So we're gonna select the floor and then drag that script we made onto it as a component, which then adds a script component to that floor. And you'll see that public Boolean became a tick box, which is quite useful. So now we can toggle them off within the editor. It, you know, it splits, splits it out sensibly into words. Now, if we click play, and then turn on the console, which will appear down the bottom, the ball will bounce, and then we can toggle that tick box, and the console will spit out the thing that hit the floor, okay? Very, very hypnotic. Uh, the reason I'm showing you all this is because I'm trying to make it obvious how easy it is to build a relatively complicated scene in Unity very quickly and simulate things, okay? So this is not very interesting. Nobody wants to do machine learning with a bouncing ball. I'm sure somebody does, you know, <laughs> but not me. Uh, but a game engine lets you create enough of a simulation of the real world that it's kind of interesting, okay? So a game engine lets you simulate enough of the real world to play with machine learning in a way that you might be able to transpose that to robots or cars or something that exists physically. Uh, it's often called an AI biodome. Uh, it's a synthetic environment that's a replica of enough of the real world to be interesting or to be useful. Now, there's been an explosion of all sorts of AI things in the last five years or so. There's, you know, there's physics-based things learning to walk, there's cognitive based like AlphaGo, there's VizDoom which can play Doom based on the images of Doom rather than any sort of interaction with the game. There's lots of different AI things that are popping up lately that do things in all sorts of different ways, whether they're cognitive, physical, or visual. That's really interesting to me because a game engine combines all these things into one place, which makes a game engine a really great way to explore machine learning. This is where we enter the second piece of this talk, which is the Unity ML Agents Toolkit. It is very beta, it is open source, and it is some glue between Python, like they claim it's just TensorFlow, but really it's just Python, uh, which incidentally gets you TensorFlow, obviously, uh, and Unity. It lets you control Unity from Python and ships with a bunch of pre-made machine learning algorithms that let you machine learn in Unity. They've done a whole bunch of research, they've hired some, some impressively qualified people to write papers and they've done it all properly. They ask you to cite this paper if you use their thing. But basically, the Unity ML Agents Toolkit is some glue that lets you do machine learning inside Unity with Python. We're gonna take a look at an example to explain this better. This is our example, which I'll come to in a moment. It's a little racetrack we made with some PyCon billboards, because why not? We'll come back to this in a minute. First, we're gonna step through the three core components of what ML Agents provides. So these are similar terms to what you might find elsewhere in the machine learning world. They just terms for things you'll find in Unity. So these are brains, academies, and agents. These are what the machine learning framework adds. A brain is a thing that encapsulates some sort of logic for making a decision, okay? So it receives observations and then gives back a decision based on those observations. That's all it does. Much like our brain, its job is to control things, okay? There's multiple types of brain you can create using the ML Agents Toolkit. There's the player brain, which is just a brain controlled by a person, so you can connect a player brain to keys on a keyboard for testing things. There's a heuristic brain where you can write code, you know, AI, which basically just means lots of if statements. Uh, and then there's a learning brain, which can be piped into TensorFlow or read a neural net 
uh, which is just a PB file from TensorFlow and infer somehow. It's a brain. A brain makes decisions based on input. Input is observations. There's an academy which sits between the brain and the thing that it is controlling. The, brain orchest uh, the academy orchestrates decisions from the brain, or brains as it might be, which we'll come to in a minute. Everyone wants multiple brains. Uh, and the academy talks to the brain and then talks to the agent and mediates that process. The academy is also where you set environmental wide things like you know, rendering quality and speed and stuff because when you're training you want it to go very fast and when you're inferring you probably want to look at your simulation and see it at the speed a human can comprehend. Uh, the academy also has an inter-process communication which talks to Python. So remember this is all sitting within Unity. So we need to talk to Python somehow. And finally we have the agent which is a thing that exists in the Unity simulation that is being controlled by the brain through the academy. The agent generates observations somehow in the world tells the brain what's found. The brain says, okay, based on those observations, I'd like you to do this. Okay, it also assigns rewards. We'll get to that in a second. So that's the three components. The easiest way to look at this again is to step through an example. But there's multiple ways you can train and learn. Uh, there's reinforcement learning, there's neuroevolution, there's imitation learning. Imitation learning is where you kind of give it an example of an optimal policy and then it tries to its best to mimic that. Reinforcement learning is the one we're gonna look at today because it's based on rewards. So you punish it and you reward it for doing the right thing. So we're going to quickly look at imitation, uh, reinforcement learning, not imitation learning, reinforcement learning. At the core of reinforcement learning are these three concepts, actions, observations, and rewards. So an agent does stuff, those are the actions. It sees stuff, those are the observations, and it is rewarded or penalized appropriately. We call the reward, even though it can be negative, uh, rewarded or penalized appropriately for based on what it's done through the brain, okay? The goal of reinforcement learning is to learn a policy which is mapping observations to actions to do whatever it is you want it to do. Everyone with me so far? These are just slightly different terms for pretty much standard machine learning stuff so far. So actions are just a number. It can be discrete or continuous actions. You know, a number can just map to something or it can just be a continuous stream of numbers that maps to a, a range. Observations can be vectors, so more numbers or pictures. Because Unity is a game engine, you can put cameras in the environment and then render out that picture into the machine learning environment. So you can use convolutional neural networks to make decisions based on what it can see. Unity is also high fidelity enough that those pictures can replicate the real world well enough. So the Chinese Uber, I always forget its name, DD maybe, is using Unity to do machine learning for their cars by building simulation versions of it. Uh, and rewards are just more numbers. One, positive numbers are good, negative numbers are bad. The cycle is basically the agent perceives the environment using observations. The brain receives those observations from the agent. The brain makes a decision and sends it to the agent. The agent is rewarded or penalized based on what's going on. Pretty straightforward. So these pictures are nice, but if we put this into practice, it will hopefully make a bit more sense. A typical setup might look a bit like this. There'll be an academy which talks to TensorFlow for training, which talks to a brain, and then there's lots and lots of agents connected to that brain. The reason there's lots of them usually is because you want to train in parallel because you want more observations, the better. You know, we've got lots of computers. We want to spin up a 10,000 AWS instances with this thing and make it train fast. Realistically, there might also just be one agent if you're messing around with it. The problem, the process is pretty straightforward. You define a problem and try and address it. Let's actually look at how we're going to do this. Let's jump to some actual some stuff here. Don't, you don't need to take pictures of this. There's a blog post which tells you how to do this, which I'll put up a link to at the end. But what you need is you need Unity, which you can get for free. You need something you want to build. We're going to build a self-driving car in a moment. And you need a way to play it like a game to make sure it's working, which we'll get to as well. And on top of that, you need the Python bits. I like Anaconda because it makes Python not a headache for me. Uh, so I use Anaconda, but you need a Python 3.6 environment for various reasons, mumble mumble, TensorFlow. Uh, you need to get into that environment, but you know you can use virtual env or whatever environment you actually like. You need a very specific version of TensorFlow currently for Python uh, machine learning with Unity, but they're working on that. And you need the ML Agents Toolkit. It's a pretty standard Python workflow. You need some bits. You install them from some arbitrary package managers and hope, hope it's going to work. Once you've got all this going, you build your environment. This is the environment we built. It's a racetrack. It's pretty cool. It has a car. The car is actually more of a bulldozer. Not sure why. We got excited. Uh, that car has a script attached, which is a car controller. This car controller is something that Unity supplies. It's not part of Unity. It's just part of their default asset kit, which is some stuff you might need to make a game. And Unity, because people make games about cars, supplies a way to make a car very simply. 
this car controller kind of knows the car needs to accelerate, have torque, have wheels, things like that, and abstracts the control of the car down to left, right, throttle, brake. Okay? We didn't write this. This is just something you can add to any object in Unity that kind of resembles a car. You could make a cube drive around if you wanted it to be a car. Unity really doesn't care what you attach this to as long as you give it the right bits. This is just a script that lets us say this car can go forward, reverse, brake, and go left and right. And behaves kind of like a car and then it accelerates and throttles and stuff. In addition to that, in our racetrack, we have these invisible walls around the, the wall, the edge of the track. This is kind of hard to see. So if you can see, there's like these green boxes that are popping up out of the, the barrier. I'm, I'm really colorblind, so apologies if you're colorblind like me and can see absolutely nothing. There are green boxes all around, which are fancy triggers. They're invisible collision volumes, which are there. So if our car goes through those in the 3D simulation, a signal is sent that says, hey, I collided with something. They don't actually stop the car. So they're just, the, 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 the visual barrier you see is not going to make the car stop and collide. It's just going to let it go right through it. But because there's those green boxes there, it will call a thing that says, hi, you know, you collided with something. You probably want to do something about that. Okay? They're called box colliders, which are set to be a trigger. So there's a little trigger tick box there, which basically says, I don't want you to make the car stop when you hit this. I just want you to let it go straight through it and let me call an on-triggered function that says, hi, I went through something that was a trigger. Also around our track, we have some waypoints which span the entire track in order. Uh, they're the little yellow dots. They let us reset the car to a certain point if it goes out. So if it, if it goes through one of those triggers, it's bad, and we want to move it back onto the track. We use those waypoints to reset it to the closest place it collided with the trigger. Okay. Uh, finally, as you can see here, the car actually has a camera mounted on the front of it, which is this, this cone you can see. And then there's the preview of the camera, pointed forward. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, but we're using that as the, the input into the machine learning system for what the car is making its decisions on. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense right now. We've made a car with a camera pointed forward. We've set up a track so the car will can reset if it leaves the track. And there's waypoints around the track so we can reset the car to the closest position that it left the track if it does leave the track. And the car can drive like a car. To get the machine learning happening, we need some brains. Brains are always useful. I mentioned earlier the player brain, which is basically just something that lets us steer the car as a human to test that it works. This is the player brain. Not very interesting. We also need a learning brain. The player brain has some key mappings which send left and right. The car actually automatically accelerates because that was just easier for demo purposes. So the throttle just applies automatically. The only input is left and right. We also need a learning brain, which is exactly the same as the player brain. The key thing here is the learning brain is set up to have a visual observation of 32 pixels by 24 pixels grayscale. And that's attached to that camera at the front of the car. So this is the only input the machine learning system has from the car. It, it can see that picture at kind of garbage low resolution. We also need our academy object, which is the thing that mediates what's going on. It knows that there's two possible brains. There's the player brain and the learning brain. The player brain, again, is just there so we can test the car works. Okay. There's also some settings about training and inference. All of these settings do, that say, uh, do uh, say that if we're training, we want the simulation to run really fast at an increased time scale and not pay attention to frame rate or render resolution. And if we're inferring, we want it to run at 1280 by 720 and 30 FPS so a human can look at it. Okay, so you can set different settings for training and inference. You can also run Unity entirely headless and you know, the rendering will be something you never see. Just because it's a game engine, you need to supply these parameters. We also set our car up as an agent. This is our car agent. It's set up to know that it has one camera, which, as mentioned, maps to the camera on the agent. And it also knows about those waypoints. This is not something that's part of the machine learning system. We added this so we could reset the car to the right position if it left the track. But the car knows the waypoints, which means it can calculate the closest waypoint to where it left the track and bring itself back if it's told to. Then we need to implement some actions. As I mentioned, the car can only go left or right. That's the only control we have. It automatically accelerates. So we use this agent action method, which is the thing that the machine learning system will call to control the car. It takes a vector action array, which only has one entry, so vector action zero, and that value can either be minus one or one. Minus one is left, one is right in this case. We pass that value directly into the car controller, which is the thing that we created in Unity. And because we're automatically throttling, we set throttle to one. Okay, and then the only value that's going in is the first one, which is left or right. Again, minus one is left, one is right. That's literally all that is doing. And then we check if we're collided. There's some stuff elsewhere on the car that sets is collided to collided if it's gone through one of those individual collision barriers. Uh, if we are collided, then 
Uh, we get a big negative reward, which is a punishment, which is bad. Uh, and if we're not collided, then we're probably still driving. We're a good car. We get a very small reward for still driving. Okay, and that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, so car steers left or right. If it's collided with something, it gets a punishment and is asked to reset to the closest position. If it didn't collide with something, it gets a reward, which means it's still going. Remembering the car can only go forward, so it can't accidentally learn to drive backwards around the track. At this point, we can fire it up and use our player brain to drive the car around the track. This is me controlling the car right now, not any sort of AI, so I'm just using A and D on my keyboard to steer this car around the track. I'm not very good at driving cars in video games or in the real world, uh, but you can see it, it works like a video game. If I hit the edge, it resets. Pretty straightforward. Again, this is just me driving. Let's add some machine learning, okay? So to train the car to drive itself, we need to set the academy up for training by ticking that control box. That control box says, hi, I would like you to let Python control the brain that the control box is next to. The reason there's a control box only next to that brain is because that's the learning brain. The, the player brain can't be controlled by Python. Uh, we also need to swap the brain on the car agent to point to the learning brain instead of the player brain. So we're basically just saying, hi, we'd like you to use the learning brain, not the player brain. And the learning brain is a brain that can be controlled by TensorFlow or have a TensorFlow graph pointed at it. Uh, as a reminder, our learning brain is set up to use one camera and it knows how to make a vector, activation, uh, vector actions with a space size of one. So we basically the brain can send either left, minus one, or right into Unity and can see that camera at 32 by 24. You can check this by checking back to the player brain. D is mapped to one and A is mapped to minus one. Otherwise, it's set up exactly the same. So player brain, keyboard, learning brain, some sort of machine learning magic. We also need to set the academy up, as we said, tick the control box. Now it comes to the, the best part of machine learning, lots of magic numbers. Uh, so we obviously need some hyperparameters in a YAML file because it's not machine learning unless there's a YAML file and hyperparameters. Uh, this is our YAML file. We're using a training system called Proximal Policy Optimization, which is gradient ascent, yada, yada, yada. Please come and talk to me later if you want me to talk about this. This is a very practical talk. And we have a section named specifically after the brain we want to train, which has some extra parameters. These are arrived at by trial and error. Standard machine learning stuff, basically. <laughs> uh, we again fire up Python, point it to our YAML file, and let it train. This is what happens. Unity gives us a nice ASCII logo. It's very exciting. Then it finds the brains. We can see here it knows we have two brains, a PyCon player brain and a PyCon learning brain, and it knows what sort of actions and observations the brain has. Okay, so it knows we have one visual observation and one kind of vector observation. Ve vector action, sorry, not vector observation. Very exciting. Then it reads the hyperparameters. Also very exciting. Then it trains. Very good, standard training process. We kill the training whenever we want and it writes out our protobuf file, which is standard TensorFlow. Garbage. Uh, and then from that, we can write out a TensorFlow graph NN file, which we can then use to run on, infer on the car. Because this is TensorFlow, we can use all the, the, the glorious TensorFlow tools like TensorBoard, so we can make sure the mean reward is going up and things like that. It's very exciting. Uh, this is from a training run that lasted like 30 seconds, so don't pay too much attention to it. I was just proving that TensorBoard works. Uh, so what's going on here? The car agent is making a camera observation. The brain is receiving that observation. The brain is deciding left or right. And then once the action is taken, we're checking if we're collided. If we're collided, we're getting a punishment and resetting. If we're not collided, we're getting a small reward and continuing. OK, pretty much reinforcement learning. Uh, and when we're training it, the car is taking random actions, so random left or right actions constantly at very high speed to optimize that policy. OK, nothing magical. If we attach that train neural net TensorFlow graph to the learning brain, which is just a field you can drag in, Inference doesn't use TensorFlow. Inference is built into Unity. This is so if you build out a binary and ship it on like an Android or an iOS device, you do not have to ship TensorFlow Lite or TensorFlow. Unity has a Unity inference engine, which is compatible with TensorFlow graph files. It's not fully compatible. That's another talk entirely. Uh, and we tell the Academy we no longer need control to be passed to Python. Then we can run, and our car will drive by itself. And now this video is our train brain driving the car around the track, probably slightly better than I actually managed to. Uh, and this is about an hour of training, maybe, using reinforcement learning. And that's pretty damn solid for something that's only making decisions based on that grayscale 32 by 24 camera. Uh, obviously, the environment is very simple, but still, this is very cool and very quick and a very visual way to look at machine learning things. It hasn't crashed yet. I crashed very quickly. 
Okay, so just to summarize a couple of other things you might be interested in before we finish. There's two Python-y things that come with Unity's ML agents. There's Python's ML agents-learn, which is what you saw, which is a pre-built entry point into some pre-built algorithms, imitation learning, reinforcement learning, and a couple of other things that let you use pre-written implementations based on proximal policy optimization, PPO, to train things in Unity. They basically let you say, hi, Unity, please let me fire up an environment, read this hyperparameter file and train for me, and not think about it beyond that. The other option is mlagents.env, which is actually a full Python API that lets you interact with Unity. And I don't expect you to read this code. This is just proof it works. Uh, this means you can do, you can ignore the machine learning bit and use the Python API to interact with the Unity environment now. So you can con fully control the Unity environment from Python and script it to do whatever you like. It is designed to do machine learning though. So this code, for example, takes random actions based on the action space of the brain and then reports back on the progress. And this is just running in a Jupyter notebook. So you can fully incorporate a simulation environment in whatever you're doing in Python and use that for whatever nefarious purposes you need. This is very powerful because you have access to this full simulation glory of Unity. So all sorts of amazing things are achievable when you combine TensorFlow and Python with Unity. This is one of my favorite ones. This is one of those classic Walker things. This is a humanoid with 26 degrees of freedom corresponding to articulations of hips, chest, spine, head, thighs, shins, feet, forearms, arms, hands, and the agent needs to go forward as fast as it can without falling over. And it's rewarded for staying upright and going in the right direction. Uh, its observations are actually 215 different variables corresponding to the rotation of all its limbs. And it learns to walk given about 24 hours of training. This is as far as it gets. Longer, longer makes it walk a lot better. But this is pretty cool. There's no walk animation here. This thing has taught itself to walk. Okay? So in conclusion, a game engine is a really cool way of simulating enough of the real world to make something useful with machine learning. It's a synthetic replica of the real world. I highly recommend you try it. If anyone has any questions, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, there'll be a link on both of those websites to a blog post which tells you how to get started. That's possibly already up. Uh, thank you very much. We do have time for one or two questions right now. Brilliant. So if there's any questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, no my question is, how do you um, decide the reward, the 0 0.05 and the 1 for two different... Um, oh, that's, that's more machine learning magic numbers. So the question was, how do you decide the reward with 0 0.05, for example? Uh, you guess. It's machine learning, OK? We don't really know what we're doing. We need to admit that at some point. Uh, <laughs> no, trial, trial and error. So you, you, the, you want to avoid like local maxima problems, and you want to avoid getting into like a right... You, there's, there's, there's papers on this. Basically. When you're doing something with machine learning, you have a certain element of trial and error. And in this case, giving it a very large reward for failing encourages it not to fail. And giving it a very small reward for succeeding encourages it to keep trying. It's basically the same way you are remunerated at work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's fair. <laughs> Uh, hi. Hello. For those of us who are originally data scientists yes. and not so much programmers, yes. how do we overcome the intimidation which I experience currently from looking at all the code that you need to write in Unity? So how do you like okay. get into this? That's quickly? a great question. So Unity is actually incredibly friendly. And if you don't want to write code, there's ways to use Unity that don't require code at all. There's a visual programming language which lets you bolt blocks together to do logic. It's usable by children. It's like Scratch, if anyone's ever used Scratch. It's very similar to that, but controls Unity. That is fully compatible with this environment. So if you do not want to write any C-sharp, you can mostly avoid that. Uh, the C-sharp is also mostly boilerplate. Really, the only bit you need to worry about is rewarding things and making actions. So there's pretty much stuff out there to do almost anything you like. Uh, do not be intimidated. Unity is about the most friendly programming environment you can ever encounter. It's very visual, and things are composed by blocks. You don't have to worry about weird inheritance situations because you're just bolting pieces together. It's kind of entity based in some ways. So really don't be, Unity is super friendly. Don't, don't be intimidated by Unity. It's a cop out answer. <laughs> oh, I think that we don't have any more time for questions. Sure. So thank you, Paris. Thank you. Uh, Ooh, thank you. Brilliant.